Chris and I have been on the phone a great deal, and I'd like to thank him and his associates for screening my film and Steve's film, and it's a pleasure to be here. I was also given the case for Morris very early in my career as a filmmaker, and um, it's a pleasure to finally meet Dr. Robert Zubrin. I believe that films should speak for themselves, so I'm only going to make a few short remarks here about Roving Morris. First thing you should pay attention to is Philip Glass's wonderful musical score for the film. We really lucked out, and I think it's one of the best movie scores he's uh, ever done. Secondly, if you listen carefully at the beginning of the movie, the voice of God talking about space is actually Paul Newman. <laughs> and it may indeed have been the last film he ever worked on. Disney assured me, no chance, George, you'll never get Paul Newman. We've been after him for years. But I knew something that tied me to Paul Newman they didn't know. When I was about 25, I worked on, as a press secretary for Paul McCloskey, who ran against Richard Nixon for pre president. My principal job in that campaign was to get and make sure that Paul Newman had a case of St. Pauli girl beer every single day in the back of the car that he was driving in. And I never failed him. He never forgot that. And when Disney could not get his agent on the phone, I called him up and asked him if he would do it, and he said he would, which is terrific. He came into the sound studio to do the recording, and clearly was not as well as Paul Newman I knew. And at the end of this recording session, he said, now, George, I've got to go down to my car, which is parked somewhere on Broadway in New York. So I went down with him to make sure he got into his car. It was a very hot summer day, and traffic was backed way up on Broadway. And the sidewalks were overflowing. Were overflowing. Paul said, George, follow me. He walked straight up Broadway into the traffic. Every truck driver got out of their cab, applauded him on, on the spot, and this loud cheer went up Broadway as Paul Newman left the recording studio with the recording you will hear now. Thank you. Again, the thing that really hit me was how clean those rovers look. <laughs> it's been five and a half years. Um, let me tell you a little bit about this. Uh, how's it? Yeah, it's cutting in and out now. Uh, let me say a little bit about how at least from my own perspective. Um, the genesis of that film actually began with my little brother. Uh, my younger brother, Tim Squires, is a uh, very well-known film editor. He's worked with uh, many famous directors, including uh, Ang Lee, Robert Altman, and George Butler. And Tim was working with George on one of the Why don't I just yell? Let's just turn this off. quality uh, capability to the surface of Mars. George immediately recognized the opportunity of this, uh, this presented. Tim, my brother, arranged a meeting between George and me. We sat down together at George's home in New York. Uh, I told George about the rovers. George told me about IMAX. And what I began to realize was that IMAX was the right medium for telling our story. It is an incredibly visual medium, our cameras could really deliver IMAX quality images, and George decided to go off and get the movie made. Now, one of the things that I realized watching George in action is that getting movies made is sort of like sending missions to Mars. You've got to be relentless 
about trying to round up the funding to make it happen. There are way, way, way more good ideas for movies than there are actual movies that get made. It's artificial. And George worked and worked and worked, and he finally managed to round up the funding to make the film. Now, at the time that Disney, that's okay, I'm just telling you. Oh, the video. <laughs> it's always the media. Right? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. All right. Cool. Now, at the time George got funded, we were at the Cape. We were already at Cape Canaveral. And we were, as you saw in the film, we were way, way, way behind schedule. Whether or not we, was, we were going to make it to the launch pad, make it to the launch pad, pretty much in question. So we're working these long shifts. Everybody's worn out. Everybody's exhausted. And these movie guys show up. And they got a truck, and they got a crane, and they got a camera the size of a washing machine, and they want to come in and start filming us as we're doing this stuff. And everybody on the project was a little nervous about this. It's not like we can do some test and then have the director say, oh, we didn't quite get that. Could we get another take, please? Okay. George was very good about it. They came in, real fly on the wall stuff, didn't interfere with our testing at all. But still, everybody on the project was a little queasy about it. And then George, this is where George really showed his true brilliance, I think. He shot what must have been, oh, six or seven minutes of really good stuff at the Cape. Some of the stuff that you saw with that, that beautiful spacecraft at Cape Canaveral. And then for the Spirit launch, still much yet to happen on the project. For the Spirit launch, of course, the whole project team is down there. We all had our families down there. George rented out the IMAX theater at Cape Canaveral at Kennedy Space Center. Show, screened his, his, uh, his uh, Shackleton film and invited the whole project team to come. And then he showed us, with a nice music soundtrack, about six minutes of IMAX footage of our spacecraft as it had looked in the high bay at, at, at Cape Canaveral, really, just weeks before. And I remember when that first image of the spacecraft came up, you know, five stories high, you could just feel this chill go through the audience. And after that, George got all the access he needed. <laughs> um, the film tells the story wonderfully, so I, I, I don't need to, to tell the story of the rovers up to the end of the film. Uh, one point that I do want to make about the film has to do with that magnificent animation, the digital animation that you saw by Dan Moss, and the wonderful blending of animation and real MER images. The accuracy with which Dan depicted what happened to our vehicles is just, to me, still staggering. Just as one example. As our vehicles were going through the landing process, inside those airbags, plummeting towards the surface and bouncing on the surface, we had accelerometers and gyros running. Those produced very detailed data on all the motions that the vehicle took place. What you see in the film is bounce for bounce, exactly what the vehicles did. There's no Hollywood gimmickry there. It's exactly what the vehicles did. Every single bounce is as it happened on Mars. Um, the story, of course, has continued since the end of the film. The film, I guess, came out, what, four years ago now? Three or four years ago now? And the rovers are still going. Um, Spirit and Opportunity are both doing fine. Uh, Spirit's bogged down at the moment. We have high hopes of getting her unstuck starting in the next week or two. Uh, Spirit has gone on to make many more discoveries than are mentioned in this film. Probably the most exciting one being discovery of, of very, very pure silica deposits in the soil. Uh, of the sort that one might find in a hot spring or hydrothermal environment. That was a big, exciting discovery for us, made 1,200 days into what was supposed to be a 90-day mission. Um, opportunity, let's see, Spirit has gone more than seven kilometers over its lifetime. That's against a, a goal of 600 meters when we designed them. And uh, Opportunity just, just uh, topped out over 17 kilometers and is, is still going. And two nights ago, Opportunity rolled up to a rock that we had named Block Island, and I'm like 99.5% certain, I should be totally certain by tomorrow, uh, that it's an iron meteorite, the fourth one that we found on Mars. I and mean, the interesting thing about this one is it's got a really kind of rotten, eroded, weathered texture to it, and we're hoping it'll tell us something about weathering processes and water on Mars. So stay tuned on that one. Anyway, thanks very much. George? I guess we can take questions now. Right here, if you can speak up so we can hear.